Guys, when you see this, this will blow your mind. It'll change the way you see wisdom. And I hope by the end of this Bible study walkthrough, you'll know how to study the Bible better and you'll have some more effective, you know, tools and skills in your Bible study tool belt. We're in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7, okay? And Solomon has just said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So another way of saying trust in God is to say, don't lean on your own understanding. And another way of saying those two things is acknowledge God and trust him to make your path straight. Okay. Now verse seven is going to continue this idea of what it looks like to trust in the Lord, right? It says, be not wise in your own eyes. Okay. This idea of self-proclaimed wisdom that's rooted in me is the idea of my own understanding. The way that I understand and perceive the world, my knowledge, my limited, you know, understanding and perspective is not worth leaning on and trusting in as much as the infinite, you know, perfect, eternal word and mind of God. So don't be wise in your own eyes. These words are really important. The wisdom that comes from self-evaluation or that self-proclaimed wisdom where I evaluate myself with my, my own eyes and I go, you know what? I'm wise. Eve, in Genesis chapter 3, she actually wanted to be wise without God. She wanted to be her own God and be wise according to her own self-evaluation. She wanted wisdom without God. It was self-proclaimed, autonomous, worldly wisdom that she didn't know she was getting, okay? So, when she looked at the forbidden fruit, she evaluated it according to what she saw. It looked good and it seemed good. Essentially, the, the author of, uh, you know, Solomon here is saying, hey, don't do what Eve did. And you learn to recognize these ideas the longer you meditate on the scriptures, okay? So I'm not expecting you to like see all these things at once. But after a few times of reading the Bible all the way through, you'll recognize words like, hey, that, that these two ideas paired up remind me of Genesis 3, that, that wisdom that comes from self-evaluating me and thinking I'm smart and I'm wise and my understanding is perfect. That sounds like Eve. She did what looked and seemed good. And Solomon is saying, don't just do what looks and seems good as if your wisdom and understanding is perfect. Okay. Fear the Lord. So this is worth highlighting. There's a couple things he's calling us to do in order to be truly wise, which is if you want to be truly wise, admit that your own, you know, inherent wisdom and understanding of the world is not perfect and everything you see that looks good and seems good is not always good. You trust in God to tell you what's good and what's evil. Fear the Lord is another way of saying don't be wise in your own eyes, but you fear the Lord. And you know what you do because you fear the Lord? You actually turn away from evil. I want you to see how there's no way you can really disconnect these two ideas. Okay, and you go, why do you say that? Because of this word and here. Being wise or choosing not to be wise in my own eyes means, number one, I fear the Lord. Number two, I turn away from evil. Another way of saying it is, what does it mean to fear the Lord? in this context at least. We know what it means to generally fear the Lord, but what is the author focusing on here about the fear of God? These are questions that are worth asking when you read the Bible. Go, it, what is he really touching on when he says fear God? He's talking about that aspect of turning away from evil, which tells me what? That fearing God means turning away from evil, which here, the evil is this independent, autonomous, worldly wisdom where I think everything I see and everything I evaluate as good is good. No, it's not. Just because it looks and seems good doesn't mean it is. So wisdom is choosing to fear God and turn away from what my, my default limited understanding tells me and actually evaluating it through the truth of God's word and his character, right? I don't just assume everything I see is the way it, it actually is. Or the way it actually appears. I go, Lord, what do you say about this? I fear you. I'm acknowledging you in my ways. I'm asking you to make my path straight. Okay. In other words, either God is leading your life away from evil 
or you independently of God are leading yourself to evil. That's the idea here, okay? Either way, evil's involved. You're either turning away from it or you're turning to it because your understanding is polluted and corrupted without God guiding, okay? It will be healing to your flesh. What will? This is worth asking. You go, it? This is why you don't just jump into a random passage of Scripture and go, teach me, Lord. Sometimes that does work, but it's helpful to read you know, through a book of the Bible. That way you get the context. That way you get it in order. That way you see all these ideas traced out. What is the it here? That's something worth asking. Well, it seems to be this idea of not being wise, choosing to fear the Lord, or not being wise in my own eyes, right? Not going, I am so smart and I'm so wise, but going, you know what, Lord, I fear you. I humbly trust that you'll make my path straight and I'm turning away from evil to you. I'm doing what you say is good rather than what I think is good, which often, if not guided by your word, what I evaluate as good is actually evil. When you do that, it will be healing to your flesh. So here's the result of fearing the Lord and turning from evil. There's a bodily, physical effect it has on you. It brings a kind of healing to your flesh, to your body, and refreshment to your bones. That's interesting. So you can either run headlong into evil, or you can fear God Trust that he'll make your path straight. And something about that will bring some degree of what the author says is healing uh, and refreshment to both your bones and your flesh. Now, what we should ask is, why are the flesh and the bones here in mind? Why doesn't he say to your spirit or your inner man, right? Or, or that spiritual self. Why does he say your flesh and your bones? Well, let's keep reading. Maybe that, an- that question will be answered. I can't say for certain, but we can sure hope so. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth. Now, this is what I do when I read the Bible. I try and uh, notice any uh, consistency in ideas. I want to notice one, the one fluid thought, okay? So the ideas here are, hey, don't be prideful. Trust God to lead your life, right? And then it'll be healing to your flesh and bones. And then all of a sudden it's like, Use your money to honor God. And that seems disconnected, right? Initially, it seems like this is a completely different thought. What we should ask, as with any text of Scripture, is is there any connection to the idea of wealth and honoring God with that wealth? Is there any connection to this idea of fearing God and turning away from evil? Honor the Lord with what? Well, specifically your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. So, different culture, of course, agricultural, you know, society. Then your barns will be filled with plenty. So, here we go. What I'm going to do in yellow is I'm going to highlight the result of the action. When you honor God with your wealth, with the best of what you have and what you've gained, your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will be bursting with wine. So what I want to do is show you this word and is very important. There are two things happening, right? Sometimes the word and is going to tell you two different things, right? It's adding, there are two different items in a list. Other times, this is actually, this, this word is going to tell you what comes after it is another way of saying what came before it. In other words, honor the Lord with all your wealth, and with the first fruits of all your produce. This, taking the first fruits, the best of my produce, or in our context, what I gain and what I work for, the, the, the product of my labor, when I take the first and best of that and I honor the Lord with that, that is a form of wealth, isn't it? Right? Fruit, harvest, agriculture, that wasn't the only form of resource and currency in this day, for sure, but it is one of them. So honoring God with my wealth includes, well, the first and best of my labor. And, and here's this word then. This notes a result. When you do these things, then your barns will be filled with what? Plenty. Your vats will be bursting with wine. And I want to actually underline that word bursting. The plenty and the bursting here let you know tremendous abundance. 
So I, I, I want to focus on the words like that, where it's like unique. Those words aren't used a lot. I don't see that every day. Like first fruits and produce, you know, not everywhere. I don't see that word all over scripture. But when you read the Bible, you'll see there's a theme here, which we're not going to get into right now. <laughs> first fruits and produce here actually relate to the plenty and bursting, the abundance that happens as a result. Honoring God, okay, with my best. I'm going to put my best will result in, hopefully you can see this, abundance. There's a connection between honoring God, using my best and dedicating it unto him or his people or his kingdom or his church, whatever that looks like, okay? People made in his image and giving my best unto God. And there's a connection between the best and the abundance in my life. There is. There's there's some kind of thing God, you know, says he'll honor. When you honor him, he'll honor that with plenty and bursting wine. Not exactly wine, but you know what I mean. Resources, what we need for life. He gives to those who take care of his people. He takes care of them. Now, this idea of giving my best, right? It actually relates to trusting in the Lord. And you might not see it, but let's think about it. And this is why I said, when you read the scriptures, I understand that chapters and verses came later, but they are helpful separations at times. They often organize ideas helpfully. So here, verse 9 and 10 has to do with using my wealth, right? Verse 5, 6, 7, and 8 has to do with generally trusting God to lead my life. One of the ways I trust God to lead my life is with my wealth. So this is just an, almost an example of how do I not be wise in my own eyes, right? My own inherent wisdom and understanding of the world the natural tendency of my human nature is to be self-preserving, to not give my best, to not bring my wealth to God. My natural tendency, my human worldly wisdom is to preserve and protect self and not care about others, right? But the wisdom Solomon offers is actually honor God and bring your best to him. In other words, use your resources for others and for the kingdom and for the glory of God. And then... There's something about this where he will honor that with abundance and plenty. It's the wisdom of God that flips the wisdom of of man upside down. God's wisdom seems backwards, but it's better. So in other words, how do I trust in God practically? How do I not lean on my own understanding? Well, don't be self-preserving. Honor God with your wealth. Well, I don't know. What if there's not enough for me? You're trusting God to give you plenty and abundance, right? And to make your path straight. Instead of being wise in your own eyes, fear him. And one of the ways we fear God practically is by using our wealth to advance his kingdom, glorify his name, benefit his people. And when we do, God says, hey, I got your back. Whatever you have, I'll make it enough. I will make sure there's abundance for you and your your family, okay? This is what it means to trust God practically, And to not lean on my own understanding. My understanding says don't. Don't give. Hoard. Keep. Store up. Save. And God might say, actually, honor me with that. And one of the ways you honor him with that is by giving. Also being wise and stewarding and managing and planning. Absolutely. But what's in mind here is the giving. That's why the first fruits and the produce uh, are actually in mind here. That's what I work for. And I have the tendency to keep. But God says give and you'll be, have plenty and abundance, okay? And so I wonder if this relates to the healing to your flesh and the refreshment to your bones, right? Because having plenty of food, that's what the barns represent, our food. And food goes to what? Goes to my body, my flesh. Or, you know, having enough to drink, the wine here, abundance, It also relates to my body, my bones, another way of saying flesh. So this might be an answer to our question of how how is fearing God and turning away from evil going to benefit my body? Well, he'll make sure there's plenty and enough for your body. In, In that way, he's providing healing and refreshment through your decision to fear the Lord. And so as much as you can, when you read the Bible, 
you want to try and find connections to these ideas, try and find similarities, how they relate to each other, you know, just like what I just did, trusting in God, acknowledging his ways, not being wise in our own eyes, fearing God, that all relates to this practical example of taking the wealth he's given me and honoring him with it and trusting he'll make it enough. This has been Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. I hope it was a blessing to you. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you guys in the next Bible study walkthrough here at Above Reproach Ministry.